I was working in New York as an assistant editor on mostly very low budget horror films, the best of which was Sam's movie, The Evil Dead. And Sam had essentially finance the movie independently by going around and soliciting private investments from a very small amounts of money from business people and doctors and dentists in Detroit and cobbled together enough money to make that movie, which was probably about $100,000 when he started. I, I'm not sure. And so we looked at that and we thought, well, we could probably do that. Oh, no. Sam sort of taught us that if you ask people to, you know, called them up on the phone and asked people to invest in a movie, they'd tell you to go to hell. But if you said, I have a piece of film I want to show you, then some of them would let you to come into their living room and set up your little projector and show it to them. And this was mostly back in Minnesota you raised that it, one? it started, yeah. We shot this little trailer in New York over uh, like President's Day weekend so we could get the camera for three days when we were only renting it for one day. And went out and shot and designed this thing that looked like a trailer for a movie and was very sort of action oriented. But you never saw the faces of the actors because we hadn't made the movie yet. <laughs> Was there any template? Like, I would think with a first feature script, there's some, helps to have some kind of guideline, like what happens in each of the three acts. I don't, um, I don't know how to do three act structure. We don't no. either. I don't know yeah. what that is. I mean, I've heard of the three acts. Yeah, I've heard of this, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, we just proceeded, have proceeded by feel, sort of, mm. you know, beginning, where does it go? Seems like it's about time to wind <laughs> it up. <laughs> I'm sure it's the same with you writing. You go like, yeah, what's, uh, what, what would be good next? And maybe part of it is because you've internalized some structural thing, right. but it's not like, right. it's right. not like some target you're aiming for. Right. right. When did the Texas setting come into it? I went one semester to the University of Texas in Austin, and I had lived in Austin for a year, and I knew that it was a place that we could go and hire friends to work on the movie. There was sort of a community of people there that I knew would work on the movie essentially for free. And Texas was also a right-to-work state where it was easier to shoot movies non-union than it was in New York at the time. The movie was, you know, very pre-planned basically because we had so little money, we had to figure out what we were going to shoot, how we were going to shoot it, and that, that, that may have relaxed them a little bit. Well, especially if you're spending so much money of 67 strangers and friends, the storyboarding gives you some level of confidence or assurance that you know what you're doing and you're not making it up as you go along. Yes, exactly. You don't want to get the set at the beginning of the day and start to think about how you're going to cover the scene. You want to have thought about it before. You know, some directors want to throw everything up in the air and just see where, the, where it lands and they can make great stuff out of it. That's part of how they, that's really how they work fundamentally and get great results. We're kind of the other end of the spectrum where we're more comfortable if we have a plan even if we stray quite a distance from that plan while we're shooting given circumstances hey yeah what is it your husband the little uh, voiceover that you hear at the very beginning where he's talking about texas and uh and in russia, russia. Now, in Russia, they got it mapped out so that everyone pulls for everyone else. That's the theory, anyway. But what I know about is Texas. And down here, you're on your own. You know, that may have been our putting the movie together and feeling like we needed something that preceded that first scene in the back of the car. Yeah, it's as you know, a, some kind of frame. So that was after we'd probably done a fine cut of the movie and looked at it and went, something needs something here at the beginning. Well, that monologue alone, I think, sent European film theorists and everything to start seeing it as an anti-American commentary about the state of sort of <laughs> right. late Cold War. I mean, did it entertain you when you started hearing some of these theories about it? It happened a lot on, like, Barton Fink. 
It they seem to like, with, yes. Yeah, a lot of our movies. People want, like, I don't know why. Like, people want social commentary and stuff. The um, story isn't enough for some people. Maybe it's because we just, because it's the only thing we know, we just write story, American stories, and some of them are regional stories, and we never kind of have gone outside of that. And so people think that there's some kind of larger comment, political commentary about this country in it, or that that's part of the design of the movie, yeah. when it wasn't any part of the design of the movie. There's a quote that one of you guys said, we feel the criminals are the least able people to cope in society. Blood Simple seems to set this template of these characters that are maybe a little less smart than the average person. The first shot that I think you know has echoes throughout a lot of your work is when he's trying to clean up the blood with a windbreaker. Right. That's not an well, absorbent not fabric. Nylon. Yeah. It's just not going to absorb this. <laughs> you know, at the least in that moment, didn't have a lot of precedent in American film, at least where everything was tidy and the crime was, yeah. you know, generally one bullet. But this seeing this sort of endless horrible, and it just gets worse and more grim and more indicative of the terrible mess of humanity and how incompetent we all are, right. <laughs> you know? That's and, uh, true. But, yeah, no, know, right. we were, it becomes common. We're not into the, yeah, we've never been into the evil genius thing. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing, like, what you're describing seems to be, like, where all the fun is, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Does this hold a particular place in your heart? Even if you look at it and you think it's a, yeah, would have yes. done this no, no. that differently. It does. As an experience making the movie, it was great. I probably, I'm sure Joel would agree, by far the most fun, just because it was all new. And you know, it's like stimulating when it's new. Weirdly, because there's a lot riding on it, it's you're, it's going to determine whether you get to make a second one. But but also that, because at the same time that there's a lot riding on it at that age and at that point, there's nothing to lose. But luck plays such a huge role in every aspect of making movies, from whether or not you're lucky enough for the right person to see it or write the right thing about it at the end to whether or not you get fucked by the weather on something you only have four hours to shoot. It's both part of what makes making movies very exciting and also part of what makes it hairy. And, and generally speaking, we've been really lucky.